Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. Welcome to my MySQL course. This is a course that takes you right from the absolute basics of MySQL all the way up to pretty advanced. So hopefully whether you, you're learning this from scratch and you just have some basic computing knowledge or whether you already know some MySQL and you want to improve your knowledge and maybe learn about transactions and store procedures and that sort of thing. Hopefully this is the course for you. So in this introductory video, I just want to talk a little bit about what MySQL actually is. So MySQL, um, it's technically it's a database management system, although we often refer to it as just a database. But really it's a database management system and it's, it's some software that can manage a collection of databases. So uh, SQL is actually, it actually stands for Structured Query Language. So Structured Query, that's a very unhelpful spell check I've got here. Structured Query Language. And SQL is the language that you use to issue commands to relational databases like MySQL. So in the, in the next video, we're going to be look at what, looking at what you have to download. But if I search for MySQL downloads here, and let's maybe check this page, MySQL community downloads, we're going to be installing the MySQL community server. And we're also going to be installing something called the MySQL workbench. And they're cross-platform. I'm using a Mac, but they're fine on Windows or Linux as well. So why is it called a community server? Well, um, a, a database is, is actually a collection of tables. So in a database, you store data in tables. At least this is true in a, in a relational database like MySQL. So um, MySQL is this database management system that manages a bunch of different databases. Each one you can give a name to and you can add tables to it and add data to those tables. But the database management system needs some way of allowing you to communicate with it. So what happens is it runs, uh, there's, there's some software that runs continuously as what we call a server. In fact, if I look at my installation of MySQL, I can see down here somewhere we've got a program called MySQL D. And that's a program that's uh, now running continuously on my system. And it's a server, which means that if I go to a URL, uh, let's go to localhost, and the default URL is, is uh, the name of the machine that the server is running on and the port 3306. So via this URL, we can communicate with the database. If I actually go to it, uh, we don't get anything useful. In, in my case, it seems to have downloaded something. That's because uh, the server is, is not producing data in a format that my browser, my web browser understands. It's, it's producing data and accepting data in a format that's understood by uh, what we call clients or MySQL clients that connect to this server, which is a database management system. So an example of a, a MySQL client would be the PHP MyAdmin program, which you, you may be familiar with. And we've also got another example of such a program right here. It's the MySQL program. So in here, in my installation of MySQL, there's a program that's just called MySQL. And that's a program that I can use on the command line if I want to, to connect to my running server, my running database management system. And I can use this program to issue commands to MySQL uh, in a language called SQL, Structured Query Language. Now in this course, we're gonna be using a client called the MySQL Workbench. And this is a really nice sort of fully featured tool that as we'll see, it also allows you to design databases visually. But uh, one thing we can do is we can just connect and then we can see what databases we've got already. So I've already created a, a bunch of databases at this point. And we can use particular databases and we can see what tables are in those databases. Don't worry about memorizing these commands because we're going to see them as we go through the course. And I can see what um, I can see what data is in these tables. And this command is an example of SQL structured query language. 
uh, and we'll be looking at that in this course. So in, in a nutshell, we've got this program, which uh, is a database management system. It manages databases, which are collections of tables containing data, and it's also a server. And the fact that it's a server allows client programs like the MySQL Workbench here to communicate with it. And we can then issue commands using SQL structured query language. Okay, so in the next video, we'll look at what we have to install to get started with all this stuff. MySQL is, is a great database to learn. You can install it even on a, you know, a small old laptop. It will run pretty well usually. Um, it's, so it's, it's relatively lightweight. You can store like huge amounts of data in it as long as you've got disk space and enough memory to cope with all this software, which most computers will have. And uh, because it's free, because the community edition is free, uh, it's not restricted in any way and it's very powerful. Because of that, uh, probably the majority of websites in the world use MySQL to store their data. Uh, like it's something like a utility company or a bank is, is going to stump up a lot of hard cash for uh, probably for Oracle and also for um, like live support with Oracle. Uh, so uh, something that's got to be ultra secure may not use MySQL. But then again, there's no reason probably why it couldn't. It's, it's just a matter of maybe getting some support with Oracle. And Oracle is just the established kind of big database in the field. But um, MySQL is used for all kinds of things, you know, all kinds of needs uh, for online applications. If you want to make a social network or, you know, you want to just have a like a WordPress uh, website or something that just stores data. MySQL is a, is a really good choice of database, very, very widely used. Okay, so I'll shut up and we'll get on in the next video to actually installing some software here. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're going to look at what you need to install to get started with this tutorial. So I'm in Google here, and for reasons that I don't fully understand, I've got a Hungarian version of Google. But um, the first thing we need to install is the MySQL community server. So this is a free database which you can install and uh, which will, will sort of enable you to create tables and store data in there and do all kinds of things like that. So if you search for the MySQL community server, just go to the download link, and most of the time, all you have to do is select your operating system, download the right installer, and just run it like any normal installation program. Let's just click this download link. They do have this slightly sneaky thing where they try to get you to create an account, but um, at the moment at least, they also give you this no thanks, just start my download option here. So you can do that. So download the version for your operating system and install it. They have versions for uh, for Linux, for Windows. I'm using Mac, but you can install it on more or less any reasonable desktop computer. If the installation program asks you to um, enter a password for your root user, which is, as we'll see later on, this is the user that you'll be connecting as initially, it's really important that you, that you remember the password that you entered. It's very important, but it might just not ask you. This installation program used to be a bit flaky and a long time ago there didn't even used to be a program. But now usually um, the installers for the various platforms, they pretty much work out the box. If you do run into any problems, then um, well, make sure you are running the installer and not a zip download. And uh, don't be afraid to Google for further information if you have to. I can't show you the installation for your platform because it depends on your platform and it even depends on the version of MySQL and the, and the version of the installer. But if you run into any problems, don't be afraid to Google for that, like um, can't install MySQL Windows 7 or whatever. And if any error messages come up, don't be afraid to copy those and or just type them out, paste them into Google, do a search and see what comes up there because probably other people have encountered your problem as well if you have a problem. If you really get stuck with this, you can just search for online MySQL database 
something like that. And you will find versions that you can use on the internet. And some of these are just meant for learning MySQL and others require you to create a account and uh, maybe uh, create a database with a few clicks and possibly even pay. But you can find various free versions on here that you can use to practice your SQL if you really run into problems. Now in this tutorial, we'll, we'll focus on using the MySQL Workbench, which is another free tool. So you also need to install that for your system. Search for MySQL Workbench and go to that and install that. Uh, so again, all the same things apply. It's probably going to install pretty smoothly. If you run into any problems, don't be afraid to Google. If you, um, if you want to use an online MySQL database instead, should be no problem because we, we won't be getting too tied up with the workbench here. I'm going to focus on learning um, MySQL of the sort that you'd also type on a command line if you wanted to. But this is a really handy tool to have because it just makes it much easier and nicer to work with the MySQL database. When you've installed it, uh, you, you will, well, you'll probably have a choice between running the MySQL server when, you, when your operating system starts up, when your computer starts, which is the easiest option. That's going to run your actual database itself when it starts. And then you can start the MySQL Workbench to connect to it. Or you can opt to start it via some kind of tool that they supply you with. So for example, in my Mac here, if I go to my Mac system preferences, I've got this MySQL administration tool in there. So I'm gonna, now that I've installed this, I've installed MySQL, I can click start MySQL server and I've just gotta enter my operating system password to start that. Usually, again, it will start up pretty smoothly. You might also want to restart your computer if you have any problems. And then when you've done that, you should be able to run the MySQL Workbench. Let's try to run that. And you should be able to open a connection. So this is how it looks at the moment. It does change from version to version, but you should be able to figure out how to create a new connection. I've created one already here, but I'll create a new one. Click the plus sign by MySQL Connections. This could be slightly different in your version. And it's already pre-filled in the details here. I didn't set a password. My username is root, which is the default. This host name means basically just the computer where the MySQL server, the database itself is running. And this 3306 is the default port for MySQL. So then I can click test connection and it says successfully made the MySQL connection. So you wanna to get to that point where you can see that your MySQL workbench can successfully connect to your server. Don't forget, you might have to start your server via your control panel or um, map preferences or whatever you're using. If you didn't select to have it start when you start your computer, when you installed it. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial. Good luck with that. Um, as I say, if you run into any problems, Google it. And as a last resort, you can use just an online MySQL database to follow this tutorial. And in the next tutorial, we'll look at actually uh, setting up a connection and issuing commands. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. Now this is kind of a optional tutorial because I'm gonna show you how to use MySQL on the command line. If you don't know the command line for your system, if you don't know command line console commands, then you're gonna get lost in this tutorial, but I would advise watching it anyway because it will give you a little bit more insight into how MySQL works. Uh, but don't worry about it because we're going to be using the workbench in subsequent tutorials. So now that I've installed MySQL and I've, I've made sure that it's stopped, it's not started at the moment, I'm going to go to Terminal on my Mac. So Windows has a Windows console and of course you have a terminal in whatever version of Linux you're using as well. Now my MySQL is actually installed. I've tracked it down to the following directory. This is just for my particular system. I'm gonna to go to slash user local MySQL. And of course on Windows, the commands that you see here are gonna be different. So, you know, you could either learn Windows console commands or just skip this tutorial. As I, as I say, let's go to that directory. Here's my actual MySQL installation. Now, if we go to bin here, 
we'll see there are lots of programs in there and there are two really important ones. One is called MySQL D and that's the actual server program. It's your actual database itself. So we could start that from a command line. If we added this directory, the directory I'm in, uh, to the path environment variable, and again, if you Google file to do that, for example, Windows 7 path environment variable or, you know, Linux add to path environment variable, then you could add that directory there and then you'd be able to type these commands, these programs that you see here from any location in your terminal. Otherwise, you're going to have to change to that this directory before you can run these. So let's try and run the MySQL, um, the MySQL server on the command line. So to do that, on a Mac and probably on Windows, I have to use a sudo command to run this as admin. And again, this is not going to apply to Windows. Let's run sudo dot slash MySQL, MySQL D. And I'm going to specify hyphen U root. This specifies use the root user, which is the kind of default user for MySQL. If you specify the password, you'll also need to say hyphen P and your password, like let me in, for example, with no spaces after the hyphen P. But I haven't specified a password, so I just need this. Let's run this. Um, you will have to enter your, your admin password, your user password, if you haven't already run sudo, if you're using Linux or Mac. That is. So now we can see it started up successfully and I'm going to start a new terminal. Let's go to shell new window with basic settings. Again, this is just Mac stuff, but this is standard Unix, Unix command line stuff. Uh, so this will be the same or very similar on Linux. Again, I'll go to that directory. So slash user local MySQL bin and now I can connect with the MySQL command line tool so I'm going to just type my well I have to type dot slash MySQL on Windows it would just be the command name without the dot slash or at least last time I used Windows that was the case hyphen u root and I run that now I've got a MySQL command line so there are two programs here MySQL D the actual server itself the actual database and there's also the MySQL um, command line tool, which enables you to connect to that database as a client, as we say, you're a client connecting to that database server. And we're going to be issuing these commands in the workbench in future, but I just wanted to show you this to, to help explain how this all works. Now I can issue a MySQL command and on the command line, you have to terminate your commands with a semicolon. So the simplest command that we can start off with is show space databases semicolon and I hit return. And these are the different databases that I've got already by default in my MySQL server. So you'll probably see something there. Hopefully you will. And um, so although we've got one database server program, we can have different databases in that. So the different databases can be used, for example, by different programs or we can create a new database in there whenever we want to practice MySQL. Now I'm going to just quit that now. So I'll type quit and it just says bye and we can close this. Um, to actually shut down this server from a terminal, um, you could, like on Windows, you could use your process manager or I forget what it's called on Windows, but you have something that you can bring up to just shut down, force processes to quit. I'm going to use a kind of Unix command line here again, and I'm going to go to shell new window on my Mac. And so this, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, don't worry at all, but I'm going to type ps hyphen ef to give me a list of processes in Unix. And I can then actually modify that by saying a pipe character and then saying grep my SQL. And that will narrow down the list of processes in a Unix type system to show you which ones are running that have MySQL in the name. So if I do that, we can see that um, MySQL D is running here and that's the process ID 857. So I'm going to say sudo to run as admin kill 857. And we've hopefully shut it down. Well, it doesn't look very shut down. So let's try this. Yeah, I think actually we need this one here, 909. Let's try that. The first one was the actual 
thing that I'm typing now. Let's run that. And with a bit of luck, yeah, it's shut down. So if you have, if you if you do try this and you get lost and you have terrible problems shutting it down, the thing to do would be just restart your computer. Hopefully after that, it will work as normal. And I, I will repeat my advice that if you do get into any difficulties with this, you can't resolve them. Don't be afraid to Google it. It varies from system to system what you'll have to do, but someone will have run into the error almost certainly that you're encountering. And you can find that usually via Google searches. So this all looks good. And in the next tutorial, we're gonna connect via the MySQL Workbench instead of via the MySQL Client. And we're gonna start issuing commands. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're gonna create a simple database in MySQL Workbench. We'll add a table to the database, add some data to it, and then query the table. So my MySQL server is already running, as I can tell if I go to this little utility for stopping and starting it. So I'm gonna to go to MySQL Workbench and um, on the home screen here, so if you're not on the home screen already, but you probably are, you need to click this home button in the top left corner. Here's a connection I've already created. I'm just gonna delete that for the moment so we can start from scratch. I'm gonna click the plus button by MySQL Connections and we'll give this a name. So let's call it tutorial, or actually I'll just call it default because this is the only MySQL instance that I'm gonna to connect to with this workbench. So we've got the username in there. We've got um, an IP address here, which is the kind of local IP address of this particular machine. So this isn't on the internet. If it was on the internet, this database, my database server, this IP address will be different. And this is a port which we're gonna connect on. It's the default for MySQL 3306. And again, if you are on the internet somewhere, you'd use this information to connect to your database. But the defaults here, which were already filled in for me, apart from the connection name, they're good for connecting to my local server. So I'm gonna click test connection. It says it's okay. So we'll click okay. And now I've got this icon here. So if your version of MySQL Workbench works a bit differently, don't worry about it. Um, you just need to go through this sort of equivalent steps, whatever they are on your version to get this working. And it will be something similar to this. Let's double click this connection now. So now it's opened a tab where I can write SQL commands. I'm gonna start with show databases and I'm gonna execute that. I could use the lightning strike button, but I'm gonna use command and return, command and enter. And on Windows, I guess it would be control and enter, but that will execute the command if you've got the cursor on this line. So let's do that. So we can see these are the databases I've got at the moment, and I'm gonna delete this command that I've just typed and add create database. Let's call it tutorial one and execute that the same way. And then I can delete that and we can go back to show databases, show databases. So now we see um, that we've got the tutorial one database created and we also see in the lower pane here, which is really important, that all the commands executed successfully. So if you type something incorrectly, then you'll see red error icons down here. But these are all green showing me that all my commands are running. And it's really important to keep an, an eye on that pane down here, let's make it a bit bigger, to, um, to check that your SQL commands are running correctly. Now I can go ahead and create a table, but first I need to tell my SQL that I want to work with this particular database that I've just created. So I'm gonna type use tutorial one, which is the name of my database, and execute that. And again, we see from the lower pane that it's executed successfully. So you'd normally have like one database per different application that you're gonna to use to connect to it. So if I, if I have some application that I want to use a database, I want it to be a shared database that I'm gonna put on the internet, for example, then I'd create a different database within the MySQL database server like this for every application. And then everyone using that application could connect to the same database. 
So we've created the database and we're using this database. Now I'm going to create a table. So I'll say create table and let's give it a name. Let's call it users. And after another space, I'm going to put two round brackets. And in here, I need to specify what columns my table has. So we'll just give this one column to start with. I'm going to call the column username. It doesn't really matter whether you make this uppercase or lowercase. I prefer lowercase myself. In the early days of SQL, uppercase was more common. And we're gonna, we have to say what type this column is. So what type of thing does it store? I just want this to store text and I don't know what the length of the text is gonna be. So I'm gonna just say text here. Text is a built-in MySQL type. Uh, so this is one of the types of things that you can store in a, date, in a table column. Let's execute that. And again, we see the green icon at the bottom here showing me that my syntax was correct. Then let's type show tables and execute that. Uh, so now we can see in this sort of middle pane that it's showing me the results of that query and it's saying we've got this table called users. So we've just got one table in our database called users. I can also, if I want to see more information about that table, because I've forgotten what's actually in it, I can type desk users and execute that. And then we see that we've got one column in there called username of type text. This also, also tells me that it's allowed to be null. So we could put like null empty values in there if we wanted. Um, SQL, the syntax of SQL does vary a bit between different databases and the commands that you use to switch to a database or view a table, these in particular tend to vary between databases. So desk users, uh, this might be different in a different database and also things like create database and show tables. But um, the SQL commands you use to create tables, they're fairly standard. But again, there's going to be minor differences between different types of database like Oracle or MySQL. And in particular, the types that you can use, text or int for integers or whatever, they're going to differ a bit between different kinds of databases. So let's um, let's actually add some data to this table. So we know we've got one column called username. I'm going to type here insert into and the name of the table, which is users. And we're going to put round brackets in there and specify the columns that we're inserting into. So we just want to insert into the username column. So I put that in the round brackets. Then after the brackets, I'm going to type values and another pair of round brackets. And in the second pair of round, bracket, round brackets, I can specify what values I want to insert. In, well, I can only insert one value at a time here. So let's in double quotes. We use double quotes because this is a string. It's some actual text rather than being, say, a numerical value. So we put it in double quotes. And let's add in there a username like um, Bob. And I'm going to just execute that. Again, we see that it's executed successfully. And now, well, we could change this and add another value in there. So we'll have two rows of information in our table then. Let's change Bob to Vicky and execute that again. So now we've got two users in our database. And to see all the values in this table in our database, you can have multiple tables in a database and you usually do, but we've just got this one. So I want to, I want to look at all the values in this table now that I've inserted into it. And to do that, I'm going to type select star, that's asterisk, from and the table name, which is users. And if I execute that, we can now see here in the middle pane, the values Bob and Vicky. So when you see all of this stuff, at first it seems really complicated and some people have the tendency to make a lot of notes and really agonize over it intellectually. But the, the thing you have to do is just type this, type these commands. Don't worry about the fact that you don't understand them fully at the moment, perhaps. Just type them out and get them working. Make sure you can actually type these and execute it. So have a go at this yourself. Create your own database, call it whatever you like. Uh, the database name and table names, they will probably have to not have spaces in them. Um, in any case, it's good practice, certainly not to put spaces in database or table names but you can make it whatever name you like for your database or your tables in the database. 
So try creating a table, add some data to it and select the data from it so you can actually see it. Follow through the steps that I've actually done here because that's the really most effective way to learn. And in the next tutorial, we'll look at um, what else we can do. We'll look at doing some more complex um, inserts and selects probably. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're gonna look at creating tables with multiple columns. And we're also gonna look at a new data type, int. So uh, at the moment, I've got a table called users. If I do desk users, we can see that table. Uh, it's just got one column in at the moment. One thing to note at this point is that if you're using the MySQL Workbench, you can click on the commands in this output pane right at the bottom, right click them and go to replace SQL with selected items. And that will actually um, overwrite what's currently in the SQL pane, query pane, and replace it with the query you selected. So it's a really useful feature if you want to reuse some SQL that you uh, that you executed previously. And uh, if you're using a command line, often command lines have a feature where you can just press the up arrow to get back to previous queries. Usually a command line will give you some way of doing that, um, even if you, you, ha you might have to configure something sometimes to get it to work. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I'm gonna actually drop this table. In other words, delete it. I'm gonna say drop table users. And let's, let's just check, let's do we'll double check. Let's do show tables. And we can see that the users table is now gone. So obviously you have to be careful with this query. And I'm gonna say create table users. So we're gonna recreate it. And I'm gonna create it with two columns. I'm gonna say ID, that's gonna be the name of the first column. And I'm gonna make it an int. And an int is a numerical value in MySQL. It can store integers, so not floating point numbers, you know, with a decimal point in them, just integer values. And we'll put a comma in and make the second column now username text. So now we've got two columns, ID and username. Uh, so in this, in this statement here, where you specify the columns of the table, you can provide a comma separated list with, there can be lots of columns in there to add multiple columns to your table. Let's execute this. And um, where are we? In fact, uh, if yeah, I selected that and executed it, which only executes part of it, but I want the whole thing. So I'll deselect that, run it again. And yes, it's, it's run fine now. And let's do a desk users. So there we've got two values. Uh, they are both allowed to be null at this point. And we're gonna look at that a bit more shortly. Let's just insert some data in there. So this, you can probably guess how this works. In fact, if you wanna pause the recording, pause the video, and um, have a go at it yourself, you can probably figure it out. But let's try it. Let's say insert into users, ID, username, values, and we'll put in, let's put in one for the ID, and the text goes in quotes. The text values have to be in quotes. And let's say username Bob. So once again, we, we can just replace where we previously had a single column, we can replace it with a comma separated list. We'll run that. And let's put another one in if it ran okay, which I see that it did. Let's put Vicky in, run that. And now let's do select star from users. So we've got Bob and Vicky. Uh, so that's it for this tutorial. Do have a go at that yourself. You, you can even create tables with multiple columns. You can have multiple text columns, multiple integer columns, whatever you like. And um, one thing probably that's worth mentioning already at this point is if you search in Google or your favorite search engine for MySQL types, you can find a list of the different data types that you can use. We've seen int and text so far, but there's a lot of different types here. If we go to numeric types, for instance, and then we go to integer types, we can see that an int it can store integers between these two big values, but sometimes you want a smaller integer value. It's better to use a smaller one if you know you're only going to small, store small values of integers because that takes up less space in your database. So you might use small int, tiny int, or conversely, if you need a really massive integer in there, 
you might want to use bigint. Okay, so uh, that's it for this tutorial. Have a go at that because we're going to build on it in the next tutorial. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at null in MySQL. That's N-U-L-L, -L, null. So null is a special value that means that a field in your table doesn't have any value. If we look at the table we've got now, the users table, if we do a desk on it, desk users, we see it has two columns and we see in the results grid here that they are, they are both allowed to be null. And that's because we created them in the default way, which would allow them normally to be null. So we can do the following, for example, we can say, in, let's actually just bring up a, uh, a query that I already ran here. Um, so let's, let's insert a row into the table. I'll give it an ID of two, but for the username, I'll specify null. And that means that for the username, there's not gonna be any value for this row. So I'm gonna insert that. And yes, it went okay, we can see down here. And I'll do a select and run that. So now we can see we've got a row with the ID of two, but I set the username to null, it has no value. We can do the same thing with the other column as well, because that's also allowed to be null. And we could even, if we wanted, make them both null, like this. And now if we do a select star from users, we see we've got a row with two null values in it. Now, often you don't want that. Often what you want is to specify that a particular value in a particular uh, field, it can't be null. So you want to say that all the values in a certain column can't be null. So we'll look at how to do this. But first, let's just take, um, let's try something a little bit different. So I'm going to, I'm going to do another insert into this table. Let's try this. And this time in my fields list here, the list of columns, I'm only going to specify one, one column. So I'm going to delete username just as a random choice. And I'm going to specify the value three for that column. So we can easily see which, which column it is. So here I'm doing an insert where we're only inserting a value for one particular column. And if I run this and then I do a select star from users, what we see is that we've inserted a row with the ID equal to three. But again, we've got null for the username. Uh, so you don't have to specify all the columns when you do an insert. If you've got columns that are allowed to be null, which they are if you create them in a default way, you don't have to specify those columns when you do an insert. And then the value will be null. It will have no value for the row that you inserted. Sometimes we want to, as I say, we want to say that um, values in a column can't be null. This is really common. Uh, it's probably the, the most frequent case because um, often we don't want data with sort of missing values in our database. Let's drop this table. Let's say drop table users. So that's going to delete the table and the table should be gone. We can check with show tables if we like. And we see there's no tables in this database. And let's recreate it. So I'm going to say uh, create table users. Let's say ID, um, we'll just use the same as before. ID is going to be an int. And let's make a username field, which is going to be text, a username column, I should say. So if we create a table like this, both of the columns are allowed to be null, but we can put not null after any column to say that it can't be null. So you can do that on any of the columns that you want to not be null. Let's, uh, let's try it with, let's try it with both of them, I think. We'll make both of the columns not null. And then if we do a desk users, we see that now they're not allowed to be null. So now if I try doing stuff like, let's bring up an insert here. Um, so I, let's try, well, we'll try this. Let's just run this. This is going to give an error. We can't insert null values for either of, the, either of these columns now, even if I specify an ID, because I said also username not null when I created the table. This went wrong because even the username by itself can't be null. So again, we get an error down here. Now it's interesting to see what happens if you 
insert um, a if you try to insert a row in a table with fields that are not allowed to be null, but then you don't mention those names in your insert. So let's try it. I'll I will try getting rid of username here, and I'll try to insert a row with the ID of nine. Now, if I run this on this particular version of MySQL, uh, configured the way it is, what I find is that I get a warning icon down here. And if I do now a, so it's not an error that SQL has run, it's just giving me a warning. If I do select star from users, we see that what's happened is we did insert the row. The username appears to be blank. So the username is, is not null, it does have a value but this value is actually a blank string. Uh, that's the default value for a text type. I'm calling it a string because this is kind of a technical lingo for some characters, you know, a piece of text, we call it a string. So the default value for a text type is, is, a, is a blank string, a string of zero length, which is not the same as null. If you try this on your database, you might find that you get different results. And we're going to talk about that a bit in the next tutorial. Let's just try this again. So this time, what I'll do is I will try missing out the ID in the field list and just specify username, which I'll set to um, someone. I don't know, can't think of a name. Let's, let's just run this. So now again, we've got a warning icon down there at the bottom in the output um, pane. And if we try doing a select, now we see that we've inserted a value, we've inserted a row where the username is someone as, as I specified. And again, ID has the default value for its type. And since ID is an int, it, uh, the default value for an int is zero. Now this, this behavior, you might get different behavior with your version of MySQL or it might be just that you, if someone else installed it, especially, or if, if the MySQL developers decide to change the default options, you might find that you can't do this, that it won't let you uh, not specify a value in an insert when the, when the value is, we've said it's not null when we create a table. And we're gonna look in the next tutorial at some configuration options that affect this. So uh, to practice this, um, certainly give this a go. Try creating a table with two or more columns and make some or even all of them not null. And then try doing inserts in there. Try inserting, explicitly inserting null values as I did near the beginning of the tutorial. And try also just missing those fields out of your field list in your insert statement. Um, and miss, miss them out. So try to insert a row where you're only specifying, specifying values for certain columns and see what results you get with not null fields. Does MySQL insert a default uh, value for a field that you haven't specified a value for? Or does it do something else? Does it throw an error? Do have a go at that. And then in the next tutorial, we'll look at some config options. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're gonna take a look at MySQL database engines. So um, although this is not a tutorial on MySQL database administration, it is a tutorial on using MySQL as, as an end user and on um, learning SQL and working with a MySQL database. Nevertheless, there are some configura configuration options that affect how MySQL works. So before we go any further, we're going to have to take a look at some configuration related stuff um, because um, you're going to need to know that in order to predict how your queries are actually going to work. So um, I'm, I've already typed to uh, use tutorial one, but there's no harm in typing it again. So we're using the right database. And now I'm going to type show engines and execute that. Now, what a MySQL engine is, is it's a, a module, a part of MySQL that deals with your SQL and constructs tables, basically. Um, I'm not sure if um, the actual code that passes your query is, is part of the engine, but certainly the part of MySQL 
that constructs tables and decides what they can do and what they can't do. That's called an engine. And there are, MySQL supports various different engines. Now, most of these I haven't used, but there are two really important ones that you should know about. Historically, MySQL, as, as I remember it, this is according to my memory, and I've been working with MySQL probably since around 1999, I think. Um, historically, MySQL was built around, and I don't know how to pronounce these names, but I'll make up a pronunciation. It was built around this MyISAM engine. Now, that was, well, it was a good start, but it didn't support some really important features of databases. It didn't support, as I remember it, it didn't support transactions, and I, I presume still doesn't. It didn't support foreign keys even, which, as we'll see later on, are really important to use. So it was a big step forward later on when MySQL came out with this inodb engine, which does support transactions, does support foreign keys. And if you do show engines, hopefully you'll see that inodb is set to the default. Now it is possible to change which engine you use, and you're probably not going to want to. Uh, for this tutorial, you're going to want to make sure that inodb is the default engine, unless there's something even newer and better that's come out since this tutorial, in which case you could switch to that. But in this tutorial, we're going to be using the inodb engine. It is possible to um, it's possible to specify on a table by table basis which engine your table uses. And again, most of the time, that's probably going to be pretty useless. But it's it's quite common that if you see a, a SQL script that's um, intended to be executed to create a complete database. After every table, it will specify which engine each table is using, and it's normally going to be the same engine every time, and it's normally going to be inodb. Uh, so in case you see that in a script, it's kind of important to know about. If we type in here show table status, we can see which engine each of our um, tables is using. We've only got one table at the moment, and it's using the default inodb but I could change that, and there are a number of ways I could change it. So let's create a table, let's call it test, and I'll give it just one column. So let's say id int, and I'm gonna say next, after this bracket, I'm gonna say engine equals, and pick a different engine. So the only one I've actually used is this, my isam. So let's go ahead and try that. So I've executed that, I've created the table, and now let's look at show table status. And we see that we've got a test table using this MyISAM uh, database. I'm gonna um, delete that for the moment. Let's say drop table test, and we'll see another way of doing that. So another way you could do this is you could set the default storage engine for your, um, for your session. So you could say set default uh, yeah, this is right, I think. Set default storage engine equals my ISAM. Let's try that. Looks good. And now let's um, let's do show tables. So there, there are the tables. Just to remind ourselves, we've only got one table now called users. And I'm going to do uh, show table status. Okay, that's good. And let's also do show engine. So we see that this one table we've got users is using inodb as we saw before. Let's say, let's do show engines. Now we can see that my isam is set to the default. So we'll try creating another table. So create table, I'll call it test again, and we'll say uh, it's just got one column ID. And I won't specify a storage engine, so I'll execute that. And then we'll do show table status. And now we can see that the default really has been changed to my ISAM, as we we also saw when we did um, when we did show show engines. Struggling to remember because these are commands that that I very infrequently use. Most of the time, you don't need to bother with this, but I just want to show you show you this so you kind of are familiar with it and you're not puzzled if you come across it. And you do want to make sure with show engines, you do want to make sure that inodb is set to the default.
So let's uh, let's set I know DB back to the back to the default. Let's say set default storage engine equals I know DB. I don't think the capital letters make a difference there, um, but I'll put it all in capitals because that definitely works. And then again, we'll do show engines. And now we can see, yeah, I know DB is back to the default. Now, if you, let's say you've got MySQL installed and you find you're using, it's, it's a recent version of MySQL, so it supports I know DB, but you're, for some crazy reason, you find that it's using MyISAM. Uh, you can change it in your session, as we've just seen, or you can specify it after every table that you should use inodb if necessary. If you're the administer, uh, administrator of your um, MySQL uh, server yourself, you can also change this in the config file. So this is this is not this is kind of taking us a little bit away from the point of this um, course as a whole, but I'm just going to demonstrate that quickly. So if you look in the MySQL folder, you'll find there's a mysql.cnf if you're using Linux or some kind of Unix type system like the Mac. And it's probably going to be called .ini if you're using Windows. Now, although this is present in my MySQL installation folder here, in fact, on the Mac, and you, you would have to check this if you, want to do it, if you want to do it for Windows, you have to check where the default location of this file actually is because it's actually not here. This isn't the one that's actually being read on my, on my system, which is a Mac. So let's go to a terminal now. And again, if you're not familiar with the terminal, really don't worry about it, because this is taking us off the main point of this tutorial anyway. But what I had to do was I had to go to um, where this file is actually located. Let's go to CD user local my SQL, which is where it happens to be create, happens to be located on my Mac, and it could be different for yours. And this is it's really just a kind of demo dummy um, configuration file. And if we look at it, it's pretty simple. Um, it's just most of the, most of these options are just comments or they're just commented out. But what I did do, what I've already done here, I've added this myself because at least in my version here, it didn't already exist. I've added this option default storage engine equals my ISAM. So this is how you can configure it if you want to. So on my Mac, the actual location that this file is really read from is in slash etc. And of course it's going to be different on different systems. So you have to Google this if you want to do it. So here's my my.cnf or it will be my.ini on Windows. I'm going to do sudo via my.cnf. So I'm just using some Unix commands that I'm familiar with already, but um, you could edit this in any editor as long as you have to make sure it's not read only. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be able to save it. And let's first check that there isn't already a default storage engine option in there. And there isn't here. So let's add it. In fact, let's stop the server first. Let's go to system preferences and just I'm going to stop the MySQL server. Um, if I get the right admin password for my Mac, it will really help a lot. More haste and less speed. Okay, so I've stopped it. Now I'm going to put in here default storage engine, just like the, I, I edited the non-working demo version, but now I'm really editing the version that's actually being used. So I'm going to put my, I sam right in here in this MySQL D section. So I've I've saved that and I'm gonna start my server again. Let's go to um, system preferences, start MySQL server. Then I'll go back to my MySQL workbench and I'm gonna quit this. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial we're going to look at a MySQL setting that affects how inserts are allowed to run when the insert is trying to insert into a table with not null values. So we're going to look at another useful setting option to know about. And in this course, we're, we're probably going to see at least one more uh, very useful MySQL specific setting that you should know about. So there's this um, setting called uh, SQL mode. 
And uh, settings in MySQL in general can have global and local values. So let's take a look at, at what that actually means. Um, to start with, I'm going to say select. And this, this following syntax is very, very specific to MySQL. So it's, it's not a general SQL thing, but I'm going to type two kind of um, uh, at signs. And let's put in here global dot SQL underscore mode. So if we take a look at the value of this, we see it's set to strict all tables. So if you want to read about what this actually does, and I will explain um, in just a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, then we can search, uh, let's say in Google, for MySQL, SQL underscore mode. And in the first document that's linked to here, you get the MySQL documentation page. And there you can see various ways of setting the SQL mode, and you can see the most important SQL modes um, and just general various things you can set it to. You can also see how to set it, how to set this value in your configuration file to set it sort of permanently. So we'll take a look at what this actually does in a minute, and we'll see that it can affect how our queries run. But I also want to mention that there is also a session SQL mode. So let's take a look at that. And I appreciate that this is going to be a bit cryptic at the moment, but all will become hopefully clear shortly. So let's say two at signs and a session dot SQL mode. So we can run this select statement with multiple values as long as they're separated by commas. And if we run this, we find that my global and SQL um, uh, global and session SQL modes are actually set to different values and that's just because I've been playing around with it a bit. So when I when I installed my SQL the default for both of them was no engine substitution. Uh, now the, the global version of, of any setting in general that's that's going to set the value for any connection that's made to the server so if someone else connected to the server or you, you ran an app that also connected to the server in addition to this MySQL workbench, if you've set the global mode, that's going to affect these other connections as well. Whereas if you set the session mode, that's only going to affect this particular session. In other words, it's going to affect this connection that you've made now. And if you drop the connection in the workbench and start it again, then the session SQL mode is going to default back to the global SQL mode. So there are sessions here, but there are also global values that you can set for any connection that's made to your server. If you restart the server, you're gonna lose both of these and they're gonna default either to the default values or to whatever you set in the config file. So if you wanna set a variable like one of these permanently, you need to set that in the config file. So this will be SQL mode equals such and such. So what actually are these values? Uh, so the session SQL mode is the one that's it's actually going to affect this session. And I've got it set to no engine substitution, which was the default when I ran my SQL. Now, according to the documentation, what this value actually does, no engine substitution, is that if you specify when you create a table, if you specify an engine, as we saw in the last tutorial, but you misspell the engine or something, or you specify an engine that's not available, then um, if this variable is not set, MySQL is going to just substitute uh, some available engine, whatever the default engine is set to, for that misspelled unavailable engine. If this is if this is set, it's not going to do that. So if you specify an engine that doesn't exist, then um, it's not going to substitute it with some default value. So if we do, for example, create, let's um, get rid of this and say create table test one id int engine equals some gobbledygook if no engine substitution is set then it's not going to execute that query now the one uh, what we're really interested in here is setting a mode called uh, strict or tables and let, let's see what effect that actually has so if I, um, I've got, let's, let's go to use 
tutorial one. I'm already using this database, but I just want to show you from the beginning in case, in case it's confusing without. So we're going to say use the tutorial one database. I'm going to say show tables. These are commands that I do use a lot. And we see we've got this users table in here. I don't actually need this test table. So I'm just going to do drop uh, table test while I think about it. And now if we do show tables, the test table will have disappeared and we've just got users. Let's do desk users. And we can see that we created this table so that both of the fields can't be null. Now, um, with the default setting, at least the default setting I got when I installed my SQL out of the box, and th this is something that you, you should try for yourself. If we do insert into users, insert into our table, we only specify one column in there. So we, we don't specify all of the columns that are not null. And then we say values, uh, let's specify for this just nine or something. And we run this and we look at the query. It has actually run, but with a warning. And so if we do select star from users, we see that we've inserted that row and MySQL has inserted a default value for username which for a string type, a text type, is an empty blank string. So it's, it's not null, but MySQL has made up a value for it, which is the default value. Now, that may be the behavior you want. And in this tutorial, I'm gonna just carry on like that. I'm gonna stick with this option because I wanna try to use the settings that you most likely got out of the box. And this is how my version of MySQL came to me when I just installed it this time around. But sometimes you might want to change that. You might want to say, okay, if I've got not null values in my table, values that can't be null, if someone tries to do an insert on that table and they don't specify a value for the not null columns, for all of the not null columns, then um, the, the, the query should fail. You might want to say that rather than let my SQL make up a default value for it. And if you want to do that, you can change the SQL mode. So we could do, for example, set, let's say global set, well, let's session is maybe the most useful. Let's say set session SQL mode equals, and we could set it to um, some value in here. And you can see the most important values in the MySQL document, but uh, an easy way to do this, which sets both the local and global values of a setting at the same time, in this case, the SQL mode setting, is just to say set SQL underscore mode equals, and I'm gonna set this to, let's set it to strict all tables. Well, I'm using single quotes here, but in SQL it doesn't matter, so that I could just use double quotes and it should be fine. Let's run this. And we see that the query, uh, not, a, not so much a query, but the statement ran successfully. And now let's do select. In fact, I'll just um, bring up this query that I used previously. So we'll look at the global and session values of this SQL mode variable. And we see they've both been set to strict or strict or tables. If I now try to insert into a table and I don't specify a value for one or more of the columns that are not allowed to be null. Let's try this with the value 10 for ID, and I, I won't give a value for username, which is not null. Let's run this. Now we see that it gives an error. And although errors don't seem like a good thing, sometimes that's what you want. If you have a program that's executing SQL statements, uh, it can be really bad if they run silently, but they, and they appear to succeed, but they don't actually do what you want. So if you run a SQL statement in your program, it's good practice to check somehow that that hasn't um, run and created an error. And the same applies kind of if you run um, uh, a SQL statement by hand like we're doing here. Sometimes it can fail silently and you think it's worked, but it hasn't actually done what you want. So sometimes you wanna make sure that queries fail when um, you do something that you don't really want them to do. And by setting this SQL mode variable, we've made sure that we have to specify values for all the fields that are specified as not null in our table. 
So um, it's, it's worth having a go at this yourself. Take a look at your global and local session modes like this, see what they're set to. They should be set to the default, to the, both to the same thing. You know, unless you change one of them, they should be set to both the same thing. And uh, you, um, you might wanna try changing the SQL mode as I just did. So that's this one to strict or tables and then try to insert into a table as I just did not specifying a value for a, a not nor column and check that it, it does fail if you set strict or tables but I'm going to set this back to no engine substitution for the purpose of this purposes of this tutorial although really if I was running some sort of production database that actually really mattered. I, I probably would like to turn strict or tables on just to give me a bit of extra uh, sort of error checking. And also, if you just um, stop your server and restart it, then you'll get whatever default values are specified in your configuration file. Um, a couple of little things that I just want to mention. One thing is that if you didn't find a configuration file in your MySQL uh, directory, install directory at all, I should have mentioned this in the last tutorial really. You can just Google for a, like a default one on the internet and just copy that or even just write it out yourself. Just Google for what should be in a typical MySQL configuration file. Uh, remember, you have to put it in the right location if you actually want to use it and you have to restart your server. But um, my download of MySQL did include a dummy uh, sort of default um, configuration file my.cnf or it could be my.ini on windows it's just that it wasn't in the right place and also with queries in general because i use different databases from time to time even though i've been using mysql for a very long time i can still get confused because sql syntax does vary between different databases uh, and also if you don't if you don't use a particular database for a few months things can start to get confused in your mind and you forget the exact database specific syntax for SQL queries. So one good place to look is certainly the um, MySQL documentation, but often this is sort of a little bit cryptic and often it's easier just to do something like MySQL select query, query example. So if you forget, for example, how to do a select query, then um, you can pretty easily find just examples of what that actually looks like, like concrete examples. And that's sometimes better than looking at the documentation. Okay, we'll leave it there for this tutorial. Do have a go at setting strict all tables and see what effect that has for you on your system and check what mode you're currently using as well. So until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from Cave of Program programming.com. In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at how to delete all the data from a table. Uh, so when you're learning SQL, often it's really useful just to be able to clear out a table without deleting the table itself. And at the moment, if I do use tutorial one, which is my database name, and I do show tables, we can see that we've got this, um, we've got this users table. So if I do select star from users, that's just gonna have whatever junk in it you happen to have added in the course of your experimentation. Now to delete data from a table, you can just do delete from table name. I just wanna draw your attention to the fact that select has a star in it, but the delete from statement, which we'll see in a second, doesn't. And that's because when we do a select, as we'll see later on, you need to specify which columns you're gonna actually output and star means output all columns. Now, since the delete just works on all the different fields in a row, so all the columns, you don't need that star with the delete statement. So we would just type delete from, in this case, users. This isn't gonna actually work, but let's run it. So it says in the console here, in the action output pane, you are using a uh, safe update mode. And then there's some more information that if you're a complete beginner, if you're new to this, you won't understand yet. Although we're gonna cover the stuff that it mentions in the future. Uh, basically there's a setting in, in MySQL, which the default option is to not let you do a delete without 
actually narrowing down which particular rows you want to delete. But for learning purposes, often it's better to switch that off. If you've got a production database with data in it that you need to keep safe, it's a really good thing that you can't just delete all the rows without specifying which particular rows you want to delete. And that's what this option prevents you doing. It prevents you deleting all the rows without actually specifying particular rows. But for this tutorial purpose, for the purposes of learning MySQL, we're gonna to want to switch that option off. So you can check what your option is set to by doing select. And what we're really interested in is the value of this variable in the session, which is gonna be whatever the default is. So let's say two at signs session dot and it's sql safe updates i think let's run this and we see that that's set to one meaning it's on so if it was set to zero that's off so session sql safe updates is what's what's controlling this behavior and we can actually do set uppercase or lowercase doesn't matter set sql safe updates equals zero. Let's try that. And that's, that seems to have worked. I'm always surprised because it's really hard to remember uh, these the exact syntax of these commands that I don't use very often. And so it's SQL safe updates with underscores in there. Let's check the value of the session variable now and see what it is. So now it's set to naught. And now finally, we can do delete from users run that. So we see now that it executed fine. You can see that in the lower pane. And if we do select star from users, then um, we see there's nothing in it now. Uh, so do try that for yourself. Try doing a delete from and the name of the table you've created and put some data in. And probably it won't work. So then you need to check the value of this session SQL safe updates variable with this kind of syntax. And then you can actually change it if it's set to one, you can change it to zero and check it again to make sure it really has changed. And then you should be able to do delete from and your table name to delete all the rows in your table. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're gonna take a look at primary keys in MySQL. So I'm gonna say use tutorial one as usual, and I'm gonna say show tables. And at the moment I've just got one table in here called users. So I'm gonna do drop table users because I wanna recreate this table now. I'll say create table users, and let's give this a ID of type int, and uh, we'll give it, a, let's give it a name field, I'll just call it name instead of username because it's shorter, of type text. And also let's have email of type text. Now before I create this table, it's good practice in SQL in general to make sure that every table has a thing called a primary key. And what this is, is it's one of your columns, which um, in that column, the values in that column are gonna uniquely identify each row. So for every row in your table, the primary key will have a different unique value and it can't be null. It's usual to make um, the primary key a integer type. You can make it another type. So for example, if you had a table with um, that had a column of, which was like a username column in, so you had a table of users and each user had a unique username, important that it's unique. You could choose to make the username the primary key. You can't do that with type text on account of text being a variable length field, but later on we will see fixed length text fields, text types that you could use in your primary key. But the bottom line is that um, every table ideally should have a primary key and that's, uh, ideally that should be of an integer type because that will give you the fastest results with your queries, but it is possible to use text types as we'll see um, later on. So um, I'm gonna make this ID column here, which is, which is an integer type, my primary key. 
So that's going to contain a value that's going to be unique for every row in the database. Let's say primary key after int here. So I'll run this now. And then if we do a desk users, we can look at the type of this table. So we see that the ID field can't be null. And that's because primary keys can't be null in general. If you want, you can say primary key not null but that's implied by the just the fact that you made it a primary key. And we see here that it is the primary key. You see that the type is in brackets 11. The 11 doesn't actually refer to the number of uh, digits you can store in there or anything. It's purely a relatively unimportant display feature, which means that if you have a integer in there that's smaller than 11 digits, MySQL, in some circumstances, depending on how you do the query, what you do the query with, will um, left pad the integer with spaces. I think usually you left pad it, but that's not, that's not really important. So this brackets 11 is, is not so important. It just somehow, sometimes under some circumstances, it will affect uh, whether small integers, you know, get displayed in a field that has 11 spaces in it or not but it won't truncate your integers or anything like that. It doesn't affect how many digits you can store in there. I think for a, an int in any case, a normal int, you can get um, 10 digits in there. But if you, if you Google for MySQL numeric types, you'll find more information on that. Okay, so let's see what we can do with the primary key. Let's say insert into users ID, name, and email values and we'll, we'll put zero in for the ID, and we'll have a name, let's say Bob, and an email, Bob at, I'll just type some nonsense in there. I don't know whether this site actually exists, but we'll, we'll add that in. So I'll go ahead and execute that, and it, it's executed fine. Now um, we could you know, happily insert other stuff in there. Let's insert some other stuff, and we'll, we'll give this a primary key value of one. So that, that's worked as well. Uh, we can see those values, of course, in the normal way. Select star from users, and there we go. But now let's try to do some things that won't work. So if we go and we, um, let's bring back this query. If, for example, we try to insert some data with a primary key that already exists in there, that won't work. So if we execute this, it won't execute because you can't have duplicate values in the primary key column. The point of it is to uniquely identify every row in the table. Similar, similarly, you can't have null for a primary key. It's automatically not null. So this query, this um, statement won't execute either. So the primary key must be unique. Most often you make it an integer. And um, sometimes I see users doing stuff, I mean, beginners with MySQL, I see them doing things like um, they'll take the value of another key, let's say they had a username Bob, and then they'll append something to that username, which is already in the database, uh, to make it unique, like an underscore and some digits. This is very bad practice. Uh, you shouldn't duplicate data in your database because um, imagine if you had uh, a user with the username Bob and they had a primary key zero. This is fine, there's no data duplication. But if you, if you had the primary key as a text value, and remember you can't use the text type for a primary key, but there are text types that you can use, which we'll see later. So if it was a text type, you might think, okay, I'll do this, Bob underscore, like this. That's not a good idea because now you're duplicating some data. It takes up unnecessary space and what if you want to rename Bob? What if Bob changes his name? Then you've got to rename it both here and here, which is even more difficult. Uh, so um, try to avoid having any duplicate data in your database. You need to get all the duplicate data out there. Of course, if you have two separate users and they both happen to have the same name, that's not considered duplicate data. It's, it's the unique name for each user. It's just that they happen to have the same name. But there again, if they do have the same name, you can't use their name as a primary key because the primary key really must have duplicate values in it. The point is just that you don't want to repeat data um, in your database. So you don't want to have the name of one particular user repeated in two places. But if two people had the same name, that's fine. 
as long as um, you're not trying to put the same name of two different users in a field where you can't have duplicates like a primary key. So anyway, the way to get to grips with this is really just to play about with it a bit. So do try this, create a table with some columns in it, give it a integer type primary key, insert some data in there, and then check that you can't insert duplicate values for the primary key, and check that you can't insert null values for the primary key. Because even if this does seem complicated to you at first, just by typing this stuff out, it will start to remain in your head and it will start to become understandable, even if you um, get to a point either now or later with this course where you're struggling. Typing this out and actually seeing it work is really the key to understanding that. Okay, so until next time, happy coding. Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this tutorial, we're gonna take a look at auto-incrementing primary keys. So I'm gonna drop my users table again, get rid of it, and uh, I've got to actually write drop table users in there. And now I'm going to recreate the table similar to what we had before. So what we had before was something like this, create table users. And the columns are id int, which is the primary key. We've got name text and email text. But actually for the purposes of this tutorial, let's just, let's just have a name in there because it'll save a little bit of time. Um, so um, the, the, the only sort of problem with this, uh, which is a sort of problem, is that the ID field here, um, we have to invent a unique value for it. Now, sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes you're running some software or something and you naturally get an ID uh, when a user creates a, an, a new account, let's say, on your system, and you want to insert that ID into the database. And uh, there are ways, of, of course, of doing queries and checking that the new ID is unique, this sort of thing. But sometimes it's nice if you can just get MySQL to invent an ID for you. And you can do that by making the primary key auto-increment. So let's, let's drop this users table again. I'm going to go back to the stuff that I just typed. And I'm going to, after primary key, so before the comma, I'm going to type auto underscore increment. So this is a very MySQL specific keyword. And what it does is it means that you can do inserts without specifying an ID. And the ID that will be assigned to each row will just be incremented or increased from whatever the last value that was used was. And it's going to start at one. So let's create that table now and we'll say insert into users. And now I won't specify an ID. So I'll just specify the one column we've got now, which is at the moment, it's just the name column. And we'll say values. And by the way, I, I did a bit of checking and apparently, um, I, although I've always mixed double and single quotes, except where I was using a database that really wouldn't accept one or, one or the other, apparently single quotes are Consider the kind of default standard thing to use in SQL, but my SQLs seems to be just fine with double quotes. Anyway, let's insert something into there. Let's insert Bob. That's the quotes around your um, text values, your string values. So we'll insert that and we'll do a select star from users, select star from users. And we can see that we've inserted Bob, and even though we didn't specify an ID this time, and even though it's a primary key, so it has to have a value, we can see that because it's auto-increment, it's automatically assigned Bob the value of one. And of course, if you insert another value, let's insert another one, then it's gonna to go to two, as you might expect. So let's take a look here, and now it's two. Uh, now, MySQL won't allow zero in an auto-increment column. So let's take a look at that. Uh, supposing we do specify the ID and we specify it, let's say, as three or any number greater than two, that's going to work. And we can do the select now. And we see that the ID value of three, which we have specified for this auto-increment column now, it, MySQL will accept that just fine. It's going to accept any valid value here, which is going to be anything other than zero or some value that we've already got in this column or some value that's too big to fit in there, which would be a really big number. 
But if we, um, if we try to insert zero, we get different results. Now, um, this depends on your settings. I'm pretty sure that in the past I've tried to do this and it just hasn't run the query. So I'm sure that's configurable. But if we just run this now and we do a select on it with the settings that I've got here, which is pretty much the, yeah, it's, it's just the out of the box settings that it came with. What happens is if you specify zero for an auto increment column, as we just did, just right here, then um, it just kind of ignores the zero and it proceeds as though you hadn't specified any value for it. So it will give us give it the next available ID in the sequence. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial. Have a go yourself. Create a table with a primary key, if you want to, that is. Try inserting into it and uh, also see what happens if you try to insert zero on your, your system. Maybe it won't run the query or maybe it will just ignore it and insert an auto-incremented value in any case. So until next time, happy coding. Please consider subscribing to two excellent channels about IT, Avacodus and Ave Tech. Avacodus is a great channel with programming tutorials and IT humor, and Ave Tech is about the stories behind tech and business. Links are in the description. Thank you.